Welcome today. We're so glad to have you. This is Mountain View Church, and my name is Katerina. Thank you so much for spending time with us today and following our Heroes of Faith series. We're wrapping it up this week, and we hope that you were inspired and challenged through it. At Mountain View Church, we want to introduce people to Jesus and teach them to follow him. I pray that today will be another step in this journey for you. We would love to connect with you, whether in person or digitally. There are different ways of doing that. You can either fill out a connect card in your own handwriting. It is found under the seat in front of you. Or if you are watching us online, stop by our website, mountainviewwhitehorse.ca and click on connect. You can also find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, wherever you like to hang out on social media. Drop us a line, let us know who you are and how we can serve you or pray for you. We would also love to hear your feedback if you have any, so don't be shy. Finally, we are grateful for all the support that is given to our ministry. Whether it is given through time and energy, through prayer or through financial gifts, it is all helping us to do this work and we are so thankful for that. If you would like to make a one-time donation in person, you can do so by dropping an envelope in the mailbox at the back of the auditorium. Or if you'd like to take the easy route, you can go to our website and click on give, or even easier, text the word give to the number on the screen, and you can set up for a one-time or regular donation. We hope that today will be a blessing and an encouragement to you. Welcome to Mountain View Church. Hi everyone, at Base Camp we continue with a full program for all age group at the 9.30 service and a part and leather space at the 11 a.m. Now, as we are receiving more kids at Base Camp, which is awesome, we also need more volunteers. So, if you would like to help us, please email me and I will be happy to give you more information. Campers, this week we start a new series from Connect HQ called Peace. You know, with all the daily activities like classes, homework, sports, it's easy to feel tired and overwhelmed. So remember, when we choose to follow Jesus, He gives us peace that never leaves us. So, if you want to know more about the peace that comes from Jesus, come on Sunday and join us at Base Camp. Thanks for listening, and I hope you all have a great week. Hi, my name is Barbara. I'm a speaker and author. And for many years, I was a woman who liked things to be done a certain way. As a reforming control lover, I've been on this long journey to discover what it looks like to let go and live like Jesus. It was about a decade ago that a problem surfaced in our family. And whenever problems come up, the natural thing we all want to do is fix it. And so I tried. I got out all of my best thinking and my best tools and I tried to force that situation to fix. But it was an addiction crisis. It was a problem that began in the background of our lives and within a few years moved to the forefront. And it didn't matter the levers that I pulled, the buttons that I tried to push. I was not in control of that situation. Those years were heartbreaking. There were a lot of painful moments. And even as I prayed and asked God to take care of the situation, there were many times when I tried to hold on to control. I would try to force solutions and get things my way. But then a few years ago, the day came when I realized that I had to let go and I had to trust that God knew what he was doing in our lives. Throughout the long wilderness season of our family's addiction crisis, I had to learn what it meant to let go and live like Jesus, how to have a heart that trusted that God would take care of us, how to have a mind filled with peace of God's promises, and most of all, how to live with open hands, that I would accept what God put in or took out of my life. And so this surrendered Bible study, well, it captures part of my long journey to discover what it looks like to trust in God through long seasons. It's not an easy journey, but it is absolutely
Hello Mountain View, Aaron here, your facilitator of community groups. I'm here to give you an overview of all the groups that we have running this summer so everyone knows what is available to them and you know where you might be able to find fellowship, where you fit, where you can enjoy learning more about our Lord and Savior and the Bible with your peers. First up, women. We're blessed to have two women's groups running this summer. Two. Uh, different nights of the week, so you can pick which one works best for you uh, based on your schedule, or better yet, you can attend both. On Monday evenings, Megan Claussen will be running a six-week study by Barb Bruce called Letting Go and Living Like Jesus, starting Monday, June 13th, here at Mountain View, 7 to 8.30 p.m. Come connect with other women while studying about how to live a life more like Jesus, and snacks will be provided. Then on Tuesday evenings, Kaylee Johnson will be running a Bible study at the Johnson's home in Riverdale. They're currently working through the book of Matthew and learning about Jesus' life and ministry. This group starts with dinner at 6 p.m. and then a Bible study from 7 to 8.30. All women are welcome at both groups, so come out and build a closer relationship with each other and learn together. Men's group will continue running every Tuesday evening at Mountain View. I encourage any guys out there who could benefit from a closer walk with Jesus and a better understanding of the Bible to attend. Let's face it, we could all benefit from a closer walk with Jesus. And this is one of the ways to help with that. Show up at 6 p.m. and we'll share a meal together with you and your brothers. And then it's Bibles open from 7 p.m. to 8.30. We're currently working through the book of 1 John. And not to spoil the surprise, but following 1 John, very likely the book of 2 John. Also on Thursday evenings, starting here in July, starting here in July at Mountain View at 6 p.m., we have our other pastoral apprentice, Elijah Ischenko, starting up a community group focusing on building relationships, sharing meals, and praying together. This would be a great way to connect, get connected if you're new. And if you've been attending Mountain View for a while but haven't hooked up with a group yet, this would be a great place to start. This group is open to men, women, singles, couples, whoever. Our walk with Christ doesn't end after our gathering on Sunday. And I strongly encourage anyone who has taken steps to follow Jesus to continue taking steps by attending a community group. We're very blessed to have groups available here. But the benefits of those to those who attend are many. Thanks for listening, and we hope to see you at a community group near you.
I'm not a person who enjoys silence and solitude. In fact, I like having people around even when I'm not interacting with them. I enjoy the hustle and bustle of life and the sounds that come with it. I prefer constant noise, even if it's just ambient music in the background. And when I'm alone, I often turn on Netflix, a podcast, or an audiobook. Some of you might be thinking, so what's wrong with that? Well, although I don't like to admit it, this behavior can become a chronic problem in my life if I don't keep it in check. And I recently found out that I'm not alone. It turns out that this behavior is a chronic problem in most of Western society. While on sabbatical this year, my wife and I worked through a book titled The Rest of God, Restoring Your Soul by Restoring Sabbath by Mark Buchanan. The author outlines how the noise and busyness of life is a massive problem in our culture. We found out how important it is to purposefully and strategically build rest into our lives. And I found out that I was not giving near enough time or attention to the benefits of silence. Even though I read scripture and pray every day and even build time for reflection, I wasn't embracing extended periods of silence. So what would it look like if I started walking without my earbuds? What would happen if I started turning off the radio when I got in the car? What would happen if I sat in my favorite chair without my iPhone? I found out that I was missing out on a deeper level of spiritual encounter with God. I found God's voice speaking to my heart and mind within the silence. It has been an amazing progression of my faith journey. And this deeper encounter is available to everyone, even you. This week, we're going to study a biblical hero by the name of Samuel. Scholars believe that he was only 12 years old when he first heard the voice of God speak out into the silence. Then Samuel grew to become a great prophet whose faith was strengthened by his fervent dependency on listening to and following God's voice and instruction. I'm reading from Hebrews 11, verse 32 to 40. And what more shall I say? 
for time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release, so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two. They were killed with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. This week is our final week of our Heroes of Faith series. Yep, this is Sermon Episode 20. And so you're going to want to grab a Bible. If you don't have one, you can text the number on the screen and we will mail you a copy. Or if you have a tablet, mobile device like I do, you can go into your app store download a Bible app, and then you want to search 1 Samuel, the book of 1 Samuel. All right, so if you've got there, we're going to get started with some background. Now, there was a woman by the name of Hannah, and she couldn't have children. And she was praying to the Lord. She was obviously very upset that she couldn't have children, prayed and prayed and prayed, and God looked down at her, and he had faithful favor on her and gave her a child. Now, her child was named Samuel, which is who we're going to talk about today. She was so overwhelmed by receiving this child, she, she chose to uh, give the child to the Lord, in a sense. After he was three years old and fully weaned, she put him in the care of a priest by the name of Eli, who would become a mentor and spiritual father to Samuel. And Samuel would be raised up in uh, the spiritual environment and the spiritual oversight of God's people Israel, and he would kind of learn how to do that and grow in that way. Now, let's talk a moment about Eli. That's Samuel, okay? Young child in kind of Eli's care. But on the other side of things, Eli's actually got some family problems. Eli has his own sons, um, and they're really bad guys. Uh, the Bible actually says that they're worthless sons. That's harsh, eh? Well, the reason is, is because they're not really handling the sacrifices and offerings of the people properly. They're super corrupt, and they're even really sexually de deviant. Uh, there was women who were working outside of the tent of meeting and serving there, and they would be manipulating, coercing these women to sleep with them. It was disgusting behavior. And so Eli's trying to reconcile with his own family problems that his sons, who may or are going to inherit some of, the, some of the spiritual care of God's people, it, it's a hard thing that he's working through. And so he actually, as he's growing old, he's going to pass away soon, and he's disgusted with their behavior, disgusted with the legacy that he's going to leave. And, and so he calls his sons and he tries to warn them. And so this is the first passage we're going to look at in 1 Samuel 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2, starting in verse 23, where we're going to see Eli try to, you know, correct his sons. And he said, he being Eli, and he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. No, my sons, it is a no good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. And so what I want to pause here for is there is a lot of noise. There is a lot of chaos. There's a lot of rumors. Everyone is talking about Eli's sons and how terrible their behavior is. It's filthy. And these rumors, as they spread, think about Eli's embarrassment, right? He probably has deep concern for the spiritual welfare of God's people and the leadership. What's it going to look like? This is a grim situation. But remember, this week is about Samuel. 
So you're probably asking, okay, that's Eli's sons, but isn't there a kid wandering around who, who Hannah dedicated to the Lord and Eli accepted to mentor and, and to raise up? You're right. So Samuel is still around. Let's scroll down to verse 26. We actually see that Samuel is there. Young Samuel uh, is in the background. It says this, now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. God will not remain silent forever. And what we're going to see as this account unfolds is that even in a world of noise and chaos and rumors and terrible behavior and terrible leadership coming up and, and everything seems lost, what we're going to see is God is about to whisper into the silence to bring faith uh, to play, bring, bring faith back, bring a faithful hero back. And we're going to see this, that he's going to bring faith into the noise. God's voice in the silence brings faith into the noise. And once we move over to 1 Samuel 3, we're going to see that. Uh, verses 1 through 7 of 1 Samuel 3. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called out to Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you, lie down again. So he went and laid down, and the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Now, there's an important piece here. Before we move on in this account, we're going to keep going here and find out what happens. So, you know, the, the lamp is kind of flickering. It's, it's about to go out. It's getting late at night, right? Eli's already laying down to sleep. Samuel's kind of waiting and lying down. You can, you can kind of see the environment here. It's still, it's calm, it's quiet. There's darkness, candlelight. And, and the Lord is speaking out in this moment. And, and here's why it's so important, because at this time, Visions and, and, and messages from the Lord are rare. God has been fairly quiet for a long time. It is not the norm that God is speaking to his priests and prophets. This is going to be something very extraordinary, very special that is going to happen. And, and so here, here Samuel is, 12 years old, scholars believe, and he's being beckoned out of the silence by God. This is crazy. Let's think about this as a 12-year-old boy, right? Being beckoned by God in the silence, uh, in the candlelight, in the stillness, the darkness. Okay, let's keep reading. Verse 8. And the Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place, and the Lord came and stood calling as, other, as at other times. Samuel, Samuel. Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. Okay, check this out again. I, this, this piece of scripture is so important, right? It says, the Lord came and stood calling. Th this is crazy. This is the stillness, the night, the, the flickering candle. And, and here we have the Lord not just his voice, it says in scripture right here, the Lord came and stood calling at other times. That Samuel, this little boy, this, is, this little boy is in God's presence and doesn't even fully understand what's happening here. This is crazy. This is unheard of. This has not happened at this time. This is truly unique. And, and so let's pick it up again at verse 11. Then the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I am about to do a thing. In Israel, at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay until morning, 
Then he opened the door of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. Okay, so here we are, and Samuel's got really bad news. Uh, Eli tried to stop his evil deviant sons, and it didn't happen. He, may, he maybe tried to call out to them, but he probably could have done more. I, I would suggest that clearly by God's instruction here, Eli could have done more, and, and he didn't. He kind of let it go on from God's perspective, and so this is a problem. And so now this message is coming to this young kid. You know what? These sons are going to pay, and Eli Eli's going to be in grief. It's going to be terrible. But now let's think about it. You know, what does Samuel say? He's afraid to, to tell Eli the truth. But sure enough, guess what happens? Eli comes up to Samuel and is like, hey, what did God say? Tell me. Tell me the message that you received from the Lord. Can we imagine this for a moment? Eli is asking Samuel to tell him, and Samuel knows that it is terrible news. And this is a big, big moment for a 12-year-old kid. And I, and I don't think we, we fully grasp it right now if we're adults. I mean, we need to pause. Think back to your 12-year-old self. How mature were you? How smart were you? <laughs> Think about like your feelings and emotions and thoughts. How secure are they? They're really all developing. And, um, and imagine, this is a huge weight. A and here's Eli, who he has to report this terrible news to. And Eli is, his, is the priest, his mentor, his spiritual father. This is a huge deal. Imagine, how's he going to respond? Uh, what will happen to Samuel? Will he, will he be sent back to his mom, Hannah? Will, will he be outcast? Will he be beaten? Will he be killed? I, I don't know. I, I know maybe that sounds a bit extreme, but think about when you're a 12-year-old kid. This is a big thing to hold. What is he supposed to do? This is a massive risk for a kid to take, a pivotal moment for young Samuel, who will become a great prophet. But right now, this is big stuff. Let's look at verse 18. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again to, at Shiloh for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So this is the beginning of the great prophet Samuel. And, and let's roll back to our core passage in Hebrews 11, because remember Hebrews 11, the author there is pointing back and he's listing all these heroes. This is actually the 20th hero that we've kind of worked through, 20th week. And, and, this, and the, the kind of last things that are mentioned is Samuel and the prophets in Hebrews 11. It says, Samuel and the prophets obtained promises and were made strong in weakness. And this makes sense. I can't think uh, of a, a weaker symbol of like prophetic spiritual leadership of a 12-year-old kid. That's a big deal. And yet at 12, he had God in his presence speaking to him. And, and scripture tells us that Samuel was devoted and faithful, even from a young age, and, and rewarded hearing the voice of God in the stillness. And, and if we look at this, the, Samuel would be like the first and the youngest among a long line of prophets that would, uh, that he wouldn't be alone. They would, they would be seeking out in the wilderness, in the tent of meeting, in the temple, in synagogue, spiritual places, going out, being alone with God to hear the voice of God waiting in the stillness. And he did over and over again, many, many prophets uh, throughout the Old Testament. Samuel and the prophets practiced listening to God's voice in the silence so they could have faith in the noise and the chaos of the world. And, and this was their practice. Go, be alone with God, listen, pray, listen. And, and in that silence, hearing God's voice so that they could go out into the chaos of the world and the noise and they could have faith. They could go in faith, brave, cur bravery, courage, faith, and go into the chaos. And, and, and this, this works for us as well. But, but look at this for a second. The craziest part of all the heroes we've studied and all the prophets that, that heard from God and that followed God, look at the end of Hebrews 11, right? The very end of Hebrews 11, verses 39 and 40, last of the chapter. It says this, and all these, all these people, all these judges and kings and prophets and heroes, all of them, though commended through their faith, 
did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Maybe you're wondering, okay, wait a second. These guys experienced a lot of amazing things. As we think back of the 20 weeks and all the heroic things and all the great, you know, kingdoms conquered. And, and, and even today, if we think about hearing the actual voice of God, how can it say, you know, what does this mean that they didn't receive what was promised? That there's something better. Well, remember, last week we talked about that all the great heroes of the Old Testament, all the great heroes of faith point us to the great hero, God's Son, Jesus Christ. And, and, and when we look at this and we understand that the whole of the Old Testament is pointing forward to the New Testament, that every hero, every, every king and prophet and, and judge, godly, faithful hero is pointing us to Jesus. And when we understand that, uh, that we understand that as though they're pointing to the fulfillment of the promise, the great fulfillment, the great promise of God, which is uh, known, which they talk about in the latter part of the Old Testament as Messiah, the one who will come, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the eternal Savior uh, that we now know, for those of us that are on this side of history, and you may have heard about him too, Jesus Christ, God's Son. And God sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for the sins of the world and soon after to rise from the dead, conquering sin and death. And he becomes the eternal hero. And with him comes the promise that our belief and trust in Jesus, when we put our faith in Jesus, one of the things we get, he promises eternal life that when we pass from this earth or when he returns again, we will go to be in heaven. But there's something deeper. There is something deeper. Now, you're like, okay, what's deeper? What's more meaningful than going uh, to be with Jesus in heaven? That sounds pretty spectacular, and it is. But what about this time on earth? Well, while we're on this earth, Jesus told us that there's something going to happen when we believe in him and we put our trust in him and we choose to follow him, right? Jesus made us a promise uh, that would be fulfilled. So check out in John 14, which is in the New Testament, uh, in the New Testament, you have the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John is the last of the four Gospel accounts. And in John 14, verse 16 and 17, Jesus actually told us about this other promise. We have the promise of eternal life, but he also talks to us about this. He says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Isn't that awesome? Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And then a little uh, further down in, in chapter 14 of, of the Gospel of John, Jesus kind of talks about this spirit again. He says, these things I've spoken to you while I am still with you. But the helper, here it is, he spells it out, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. You see, this is before Jesus would be betrayed and arrested and taken to the cross and to die for the sins of the world, eventually resurrect and ascend to heaven to be with the Father. He's explaining to his disciples, okay, after that, there's going to come a time where the third part of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? We believe in Trinity, that God is three persons eternally existing as one God, and, and that the Holy Spirit is going to come. But maybe you're wondering, okay, Jeremy, but aren't we talking about God's voice and God speaking to us and, and being able to listen to him in the silence? And yeah, and, and the Holy Spirit's the key part of that. But maybe you're still skeptical. Maybe you're like, okay, wait, how does this work? How does God really talk to me? And, and maybe you're new to Christianity, new to church, and, and you're skeptical, and that's fine. I am so glad you're here because I want to explain this to you as best I can. But maybe for you, you're a new believer or you've been struggling in your, in your following of Jesus and, and you're just not hearing God's voice lately. Well, I want to help with that, okay? So the first thing, the most common way, the most common way that the Holy Spirit speaks to us is through the Bible, either a digital version or a print version. That when we read Scripture, the Holy Spirit illuminates. Uh, scripture tells us the Holy Spirit uh, 
helps us understand the core truths about God, who he is, what he does, and the relationship God wants to have with us, and how he's restored that relationship through Jesus, then we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. That those things are revealed in the scripture through the Holy Spirit, and that is the most common. And now that's the most common, but there's also the least common. The least common is kind of supernatural. And, and I haven't had these things happen to me, but I know that there are believers, there's followers of Jesus who have said these miraculous things have happened where the Holy Spirit uh, or Jesus has, a, has appeared in a, in a dream or a vision. Or some people have even claimed that they have heard God's voice, like audibly. Again, that hasn't happened to me, but I've talked to some people that really follow Jesus that are truthful, honest people, and I believe them. And we have accounts where that happens. Okay, so these are like, that's the most common and then probably the least common that happens to everyone. But there's also another common way. Another common way happens within our prayer. That, that when, we, uh, when we pray and then we pause. Like it's different than we just maybe, I don't know, pray over a meal and then just start eating and don't have a moment of reflection and meditation and sometimes even an extended time where we speak to the Lord about something or maybe we thank him for something and we're speaking to him. And then before we kind of close off our prayer, we wait. And maybe this is out on a walk. Maybe this is sitting somewhere where you're really comfortable. Maybe it's out on a long drive. It can be a number of places. God can speak to us anywhere. But in this moment, this is actually a very common thing. But like I was saying in the introduction, in our Western culture, we've lost it. And actually, people who follow Jesus that live elsewhere in the world that are more comfortable with not talking, more comfortable with just experiencing silence, more, more comfortable being by themselves, alone, in the quiet, that they actually hear God's voice more. And, and it's not that they're better than us. It's not that they're doing something different than us. It's that our Western culture is so noisy, so busy, so chaotic, and we're always go, 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 and there's always noise, 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 that we actually cut it out. Maybe accidentally, but maybe purposefully because we're not comfortable with it. But if we're able to, we can actually just pause. And through the Holy Spirit, God speaks in the silence so that you can have faith in the noise. God speaks into the silence so that you can have faith in the noise. And if you actually take that time and you pause and you listen and you wait on the Lord, the Holy Spirit will reveal things to you and whisper things in your heart and mind that, that's going to blow you away. It, it feels almost miraculous. And the answers you're looking for, they're going to be there. The, the things you're struggling with, you're going to find peace from it. It is truly amazing. So this week as we close, we're going to do something a little different. If you've been a part of Mountain View Church or you've seen uh, you know, our video sermons before, usually I close in prayer and then we do discussion questions and we get you to talk and discuss either online or maybe you just reflect yourself, different things like that. But today we're going to do things a, diff a little different. I'm still going to close in prayer and I'm going to give you an opportunity to give your life to Jesus and to fully receive the Holy Spirit. That's probably the most important thing if you've never done that. You know, it's time. Make a choice to follow Jesus. Receive the Holy Spirit so that he can speak to you. But I also am going to pray that we all hear from the Spirit today. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to read a short passage from Psalm 62 about kind of waiting and listening to the Lord. And then we're just going to end in silence. And we're going to, uh, here in the video, we're going to leave that psalm up on the screen and for a few minutes and no music, no noise, and we're just going to wait. And we want to give you an opportunity to be still before the Lord, just reflect, meditate, and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the things that you need. All right? So let's start with prayer. Dear Father, I know there's people out there right now that they've been desperate to hear from you. They're desperate to have a relationship with you. And Father, I would ask in Jesus' name that today is the beginning. Father, let them give up. Let them relinquish control to your son whom you've sent 
to, to make a way so that we can access you, a holy God, that they would give their lives to Jesus today, that they would repent of their sin and the wrong they've done, and they would come clean and accept the forgiveness and redemption that you offer us through Christ. And Father, I pray, as Jesus told us so long ago, that you would send the Holy Spirit to them and that they would be filled and sealed and that they would begin to hear you and feel you in their heart and mind and truly experience the deeper encounter of God for those of us that know it is so amazing. But Father, also I ask that you would see those out there that haven't heard from you in a while. And sometimes, Lord, you do remain silent and we submit to that, that sometimes you remain silent on purpose for a time that we're to learn something, we're supposed to sort it out. But today, Father, we ask, be merciful. We ask in Jesus' name that you would speak through your Holy Spirit. Spirit, please speak to us today. Speak to the people watching today. And after I read a part of your scripture, your holy word, and as I leave it, and as I walk away, and as as the people watching just sit and listen. We ask in Jesus' name that you would speak, God, please, through your spirit. We give today over to you. We thank you for this Heroes of Faith series that we're concluding. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. For God alone, O my soul, Wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us.